So I had made up some excuse about why I was in Houston when I called Brittany's dad. See, we had been dating for a while, and I had just bought a ring. And I told him that I was passing through the area around lunchtime, and I'd love if we could just, you know, casually grab lunch. In reality, uh, I was going to ask for his blessing uh, to marry his daughter. And because I was so nervous, I actually got there two hours early. But since I was early, I I needed to kill some time, and I was driving this 2000 Mitsubishi Mirage. You've never heard of that car, because it's the worst car ever. It was the only car that I could afford on Craigslist at the time. And I thought, maybe, since i got to kill some time, if I get this car washed, I'll be a little bit less unworthy of his daughter's hand. So I decided to go to the car wash. I pull in. It's one of those car washes where you have to go inside while they wash your car. Didn't know that was a thing. So I go inside. I'm in the waiting room. And I didn't know at the time that this car wash is right next to where Brittany's dad works. And he goes to this particular car wash at least once a week. So he walks in. And I'm supposed to be on the road. It's like an hour before we're supposed to meet. And he's confused. And I'm paralyzed. And I try to save it with some awkward small talk. He was gracious. We did go to lunch. uh, And I asked for... Uh, He and his wife's blessing, uh, and he was kind, and he was generous, but he was the most serious I've ever seen him. He expressed some things he was feeling, maybe some concern because I was a broke seminary student with a Mitsubishi, but also he told me how his hope is that his daughter would be happy and fulfilled, and he wanted me to make sure that that was a priority in my life, too. That I would be focused on being a great husband and a champion for my wife. Now I've learned sometimes the hard way that despite tendencies toward perfectionism and often an inability to say no, that I can't be the pastor or husband that I'm called to be unless I simplify some of the good things in my life out so I can focus on the great things. There's no amount of car wash or polish that covers up someone spread too thin and the damage that does to relationships. So my mission is to follow Christ totally and walk alongside my wife as the best loving partner I can be. And everything I do has to fit in that. Today, as we look at the scriptures and finish our series on simplifying your life, we meet someone who gets some sage advice from a father-in-law about simplifying what he was doing. And we'll see how that advice leads to things bigger than we ever would have expected. This all happens in the book of Exodus, second book of the Bible, and it's where we meet Moses. Moses was a Hebrew uh, raised in the Egyptian royal court. But one day he let his anger get the best of him when he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. He got so angry that he killed the Egyptian. So he ran away. He ran to a place called Midian, and there he married a woman named Zipporah, and he lived with her and her her father, his father-in-law, Jethro. And then after all this, God speaks to Moses through this burning bush. And Moses goes back to Egypt to confront Pharaoh, to be used by God to get the people of Israel out of slavery, slavery, to lead to the liberation of the Hebrew people from Egypt. Moses has been deeply invested in these people's lives. He feels responsible for them as he leads them out of Egypt and into a promised land that God said would be theirs. He's their leader, their rock star, and he starts to do, well, pretty much everything. I think just maybe Moses had a little bit too much on his plate. And right after all these events, Moses is surprised to see his father-in-law, Jethro. He shows up in the story, and with him are Moses' wife and two sons. Apparently, at some point after they had gotten free from slavery, uh, Moses' wife and sons go back to stay with the in-laws. Maybe just, maybe it's because Moses is so frantic, chaotic, busy, doing everything, they figure it's a good time to see the family. The scripture describes the reunion as a joyful one, and Moses talks to Jethro, and Jethro is a priest, a priest of whatever gods are uh, popular in Midian, and Moses tells him about what the God of Israel, what Yahweh, the one true God did, how he set the people free, and Jethro starts to worship that one true God. 
And it's at this moment that we take up our text today. It's Exodus 18. It starts with verse 13. The next day, that's the day after Jethro and the family got there, Moses sat as a judge for the people while the people stood around him from morning until evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all he was doing for the people, he says, what is this you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Well, because the people, they come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me. And I decide between one person and the other. I make known to them the statues and the instructions of God. You can almost hear Moses say, duh. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you're doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you. For this task is too heavy for you. You can't do it alone. Fathers-in-law get it. He sees Moses. He hasn't been around Moses for a while. And he's like, dude, what are you doing? Jethro, like my father-in-law, cares about his son-in-law. But he cares a lot more about his daughter, his grandkids. It sure looks to me like Jethro, who hasn't seen Moses in a while, but has seen Moses' wife and kids a whole lot more than Moses has lately, that he's intervening not just for Moses' sake, but for the family's sake, for the people's sake. I mean, Moses, your family just got home yesterday, and you're spending all of today just sitting here dealing with every little issue that comes up like a never-ending episode of Judge Duty. Get it together. Moses has come so far from the guy standing before the burning bush And saying, I I, I don't think I can do this. Now he seems to think he's the only one that can do what God needs to get done among the people. Friends, this morning I want you to know that living as God's kingdom people, living as the church, is a team sport. And Moses is out here on the ice acting like he's the star solo figure skater. He's sitting all day long trying to give every direction to every little single issue because he knows it's important. He's afraid that if he doesn't do it, nobody else will. You may think that's ridiculous, but I kind of relate to it. See, he's just led these people out of slavery. And where they were in Egypt, there was no justice. Nobody got to make decisions. For the first time, they can decide based on what God would want for them. It'd be so easy to just go back to Egypt or become a new Egypt enslaving other people. No, Moses wants justice. He cares about justice because he knows God cares about justice. But he's afraid that if he isn't constantly hands-on with everything that's going on, it'll fall apart. While it's great that Moses can identify what's important, the mistake he makes is he thinks he's the only one that can do anything about it. Hilary of Torres said, busyness is a blasphemous anxiety to do God's work for him. Moses, you aren't God. Neither are you, neither am I, neither is this church. God doesn't need us for his mission or his work, but he invites us to participate. He created us, designed us to participate in what he's doing in this world. And there's nothing more fulfilling than being a part of what God is up to. And that's something that's to be shared. We have to realize that as individuals. We have to realize that as a church in this community, that we aren't the only ones working for God's mission. It's a team sport. And God's the one that holds it all together. So Jethro advises Moses to get a team together, work united. First Temple is just one of many churches and organizations in this community working towards God's kingdom of justice and love in this world. That means that we shouldn't do everything all the time by ourselves. There's tons of other churches, partners doing stuff in this community, making a huge difference, and we should be a part of that. Just this week, I was at Feed My Sheep with Dylan Kemp, uh, watching meals be served, and it was beautiful. The temptation for you and for me and churches in general is to serve and do ministry a mile wide, but an inch deep. It's easy to serve just a little bit. Simplifying serving means going deeper into what you're great at. Maybe it's your people skills and sharing your story. Maybe it's technology. Maybe it's wisdom. Maybe you're just so good at comforting those hurting. And then you let go of the other stuff. It's taking what you're good at and sharing that 
with others, letting them discover, get good at, and flourish in that too. We have to simplify. Jethro says, if Moses doesn't, he'll wear himself out, and the people too. That Hebrew word for wear out, it means wither. In our culture today, it's an absolutely great way to translate it to say, Moses, you're going to burn out. This task is too heavy for you. So this week, you probably saw pictures of the star man. It's this hilarious, inspiring stunt and test of the new uh, SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket. They launched a Tesla Roadster and this spacesuit uh, on a trajectory around the sun past Mars. And as cool as this is, I was even more amazed to see the two rockets that launched this payload land simultaneously so that they could be used again. This means that SpaceX can send more weight into space for about $90 million than its closest competitor can do for $500 million. It's a game changer. And as eccentric and brilliant as the leader of SpaceX is, do you think he could have ever done any of this? without the incredible vast team of brilliant people he has around him. He can cast a vision to go to Mars, to make reusable rockets, but there's no way it gets off the ground unless about the 8,000 people that work at SpaceX make it happen. Here at First Temple, our mission is leading those far from God to encounter him and grow in the ways of Christ. It's a big mission. It's our goal, our Mars, our game changer. Our mission is the mission of God that God has given to his churches all across the world. And we are going to work to live that out right here on this corner of the pale blue dot you saw in the photo. And if you think that mission just belongs to people that work here or lead groups or are on committees, we'll never get off the launch pad. It's a team effort. Let's listen to Jethro in verse 19. He says, now listen to me. I'll give you counsel and God be with you. You should represent the people before God and you should bring their cases before God. Teach them the statutes and instructions and make known to them the way they are to go and the things they are to do. This is teach a man how to fish kind of stuff. You should also look for able men among the people. Men who fear God are trustworthy, who hate dishonest gain. Set such men over them as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you but decide every minor case themselves so it will be easier for you and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, and so God commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people will go home in peace. Moses, you have to duplicate. So find some people who fear God, Jethro says. That's respect God, trust God, who obey God, and people you can trust. People who won't be swayed by bribes or power or influence. Notice he doesn't say, find people, Moses, that think exactly like you who agree with you on every point. That's a yes man. Jethro's talking about leaders. Find people who love God and have integrity and let them run. They'll go places you never knew they could. Let them do what God has designed them to do. And then you, Moses, you won't wither. More disputes will get handled and everybody will go home in peace. Peace here is shalom, it's completeness, it's fulfillment, it's wholeness. Simplification identifies people who will be more complete, more fulfilled because they are using God's gifts to do what God desires for them. I remember one of our interns started working for us. Now she's about to graduate and go to seminary, but at the time she just started to do some media stuff with us. And one of the things on my plate was I needed to make a logo for Trunk or Treat and print a banner to put by the road. And I just was not, I was struggling with it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't have enough time. And so I asked her, hey, could you help with this? And she like ran with it and did an awesome job and made a banner that's way cooler than anything I would have ever come up with. So we got it printed and we put it out and it was great. And I didn't think much of it because I make banners all the time. But the next time that she was leaving work, she pulled over next to that banner. I saw her get out with her phone and take a picture to send to her mom. Because she made something really cool that she was proud of. She went home that day in peace, in fulfillment, in joy. She was energized by something that was Wearing me out. See, we've got to figure out how do we duplicate? How do we help others get great at their calling? How do we as Christians pour into those a little behind us on the road? Moses does look at verse 24. 
So Moses listened to his father-in-law. He did all that he said. If you're a father-in-law in in this room, you can use this verse against people. (laughs) Moses chose able men from all of Israel, appointed them as heads over the people, as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, and they judged the people at all times. Hard cases they brought to Moses, but any minor case they decided for themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went off to his own country. So, Moses keeps a little bit of oversight. His passion for justice is not ignored, but now he has a team of people who also have that passion and they can work together to carry it out. These are talented, trustworthy people all working towards the same mission. And now, Moses can take a breath, can hug his kids, can spend some time with his wife, and Jethro, never one to impose, heads on home. If you have a father-in-law, you can use that verse against them. So far, I think we've learned a lot in this text about duplication and healthy service for relationships. But there's something more, I think, to learn in these verses that we haven't even got to, something that happens a little bit later. So I was preparing for this morning. I was looking at this text, and Joe suggested this text as we were planning this this series, and I never really looked at this text before. So I was trying to figure out, like, what goes on around here? And I finished reading this text, and I kept reading, and I started to laugh. Because as soon as this text ends, we get to chapter 19. And in my Bible, there's a big heading over that chapter. And it says, the Israelites reach Mount Sinai. So it happens exactly after this. Now, I don't know if you know how big of a deal this is. Sinai is the mountain where Moses will go up and God will speak to his people. God will give his law to the people. God will give his vision, his hope to the people. Look at chapter 19, verse 3. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, Tell the Israelites, tell them all, Have you seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself? Now, therefore, if you obey my voice, if you keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all people. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom, a holy nation, These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. After this encounter with Jethro, after Moses simplifies, what happens next is like the start of everything. God speaks and moves in ways beyond what anyone imagined, begins the framework that will take us all the way to Jesus Christ. God declares his intentions for the Hebrew people that they might be a priestly kingdom, a holy nation. This is a moment that will define who they are and what they're to be about. It's a vision for a future and purpose. It's the same language we see used in 1 Peter 2.9 to describe Christ's church. It says, but you're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're God's own people. In order that you might proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you, out of darkness and into his marvelous light. God gives an even bigger vision for who we are and what we should be about. God is the God who sets people free, who sets people right, who reconciles us to him, who calls us to himself, who carries us on the wings of eagles. He desires for us to be fulfilled, to be at peace, doing what we've been designed to do, being a part of his work in this world. I have to wonder, was there any way that Moses would ever get up that mountain if he was continuing to micromanage every single detail? Could they have launched where God was going without God sending this wisdom and insight from an invested father-in-law? Here at First Temple, I believe that we are approaching a Sinai. We don't even know what it might look like. Right now, our master planning committee is, is looking at real data to learn about who we are and what our community looks like. And, and so we can chart a course on how we're going to reach people around us. How we're going to do our mission in this place at this time. See, because God has more for this church, for this community, more for you. God wants to use you and fulfill you and bring meaning to your life. 
But we have to simplify what we're doing so we can see the great stuff. Simplify some of the good stuff and see the great stuff. So identify what you're called to. Get on a team that's working towards God's mission and work on it together. Get great at it and then bring other people along. Duplicate. And as you do that, get ready. Because when we do that, Sinai is coming. Clarity is coming. Things beyond what we've ever guessed, what we ever would have done if we held on to everything. Things as wild as a car hurtling through space, as the blind seeing, as the lame walking, as dead people coming back to life, as lives being completely transformed. That's what we're called to be about, and that's what God is all about. He wants to work like that through us in this place, in this community. He wants to change Temple Belton. We simplify our serving so God can do bigger things. So practically, what does that look like? Well, there's kind of two options of who you might be in this story. So maybe you're Moses and you're just involved in everything and you're doing everything and you're doing none of those things well because you're trying to do everything. Get some help. Find somebody who you can teach and bring alongside, who you can help invest in and take some of that stuff away. But there's more in this story who are the people who had to step up. The people who had to do the things that Moses needed help with. So maybe that's you. What are you passionate about? What are you good at? Well, how has God gifted you? How can you do that in this community, in this place? Step up. And maybe you don't know, and that's cool. Try to figure it out. Try some stuff. Find somebody who's doing something that you think is neat. Follow them around. Get involved. We, we want to make this really simple for you. So uh, we made this survey thing. Uh, it's just a form you can fill out of places you might be interested in serving. It's on our app. Go to the next slide, and there you go. Um, you can find it. I made it. We made it as blatant as possible. You can go to firsttemple.org slash serve. You'll find it there. You can go to our app, and there's a purple button that says serve right on the home screen. You can go there. You can just go to our website. There's a button that says serve there too. Click that. Or, or we have this thing called paper. It's out there at the Welcome Center. If you're into that, go for it. Grab one of those forms. Use a writing instrument, crayon, whatever you got. You can fill it out there. Turn it in there. And we can talk about what that looks like to serve. In this series, we've been talking about simplifying all kinds of things. Time, calendar, schedules, relationships. Um, and, and one of the things we want to challenge you to do is to, whatever God is doing in your life, whatever God is pointing to that's saying, this is maybe something that you can simplify out. Um, this Wednesday starts the 40-day period towards Easter called Lent, and maybe there's something that you can simplify out over those 40 days. And maybe that's something that God's going to call you to simplify out for the rest of your life. But this is a great way to start, to identify what is this thing that that maybe God is calling me? What is this good thing that I can simplify out so I can focus on the great things? I was talking to Brittany this week um, about how this one time I, I came back from a mission trip and we were just friends at the time and I, I was starting to tell her how I thought maybe God was calling me to ministry or, or something, that, that God, God was doing something in this world and I wanted to be a part of it. And Brittany being Brittany, uh, told me that before that, she'd always heard me talking about really selfish things uh, and really dumb things, in her words. And Brittany, being Brittany, said to me, well, I'm glad you finally start decided to get on with it and get involved with what God is doing in the world. And then we got married. <laughs> but there is nothing more beautiful, more fulfilling than doing what God has called you to do, than using the gifts, the joys, the relationships that God has given you for God's kingdom and his purpose and his hope. May we be a church that does that, that's united, that serves this community, each other, so well. Let's pray. God, thank you for this place, for these people, for what you're doing in this world, and that, in spite of us, and how ridiculous we can be, <laughs> you invite us to participate. We're just so grateful that you would 
care about us that much to set us free, to want to redeem us, to want to use us, to have big dreams and hopes for us. So God, I pray that you would move in this place, that you would encourage people to seek after what you're doing and what you're calling. And there are some of us in this room that don't even feel like it's possible that you could care about us at all. But you are the God that carries us on eagle's wings, who breaks chains, who didn't think slavery was too much, didn't think death was too much, didn't think the enemy was too much, didn't think any failure, any sin, any past weakness was too much. But you redeem and you restore and you love. So God, may your love motivate us. May it push us to focus on the great, to live as kingdom citizens in this city so well. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.